So welcome to the Sculpture Blacksmithing Studio at the Toledo Museum of Art. Uh, my name is Hans Rubel, and I'm going to be demonstrating some blacksmithing today. Um, I'm going to make a fire tool, something like this. I'm going to make a little variation on this uh, design, but it's a very old traditional style fire poker. So, what I'm going to use, so I've already cut the material out, is I have some 3 8 inch mild steel. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in the forge. We use gas forges in the studio here and start to heat that up. Um, while that heats up, it won't take long. Um, a lot of us have seen in movies and TV and such uh, blacksmiths working with coal. And actually, I prefer working with coal, solid fuel. Uh, you can also use coke, which is partially burned coal or charcoal. Uh, but it's a little too, uh, we didn't have enough space in this particular studio, so we're running gas, uh, natural gas. In my own studio, I actually use propane because uh, of the similar problem. And you need the right chimney for a coal forge so uh, I use gas. Now, the temperature at which I work is uh, a good uh, orange to yellow color on the hot side to a low red color on the low side. So we have a narrow range of temperatures we work in. Uh, we don't want to go above that or we can burn the steel or work below that or we can crack the steel. So it looks like I've just reached temperature. So what is that? That's uh, for general mild steel, for general forging, I like about 2,000 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and put a glove on here. And the first thing I'm going to do is uh, make it what we call a chisel taper. Uh, basically, uh, kind of think of like a flat screwdriver. So I'm going to bring that over to the anvil and use my hammer. hammer two sides of the metal and I let the anvil do the other two sides for me. So metal is cooled off, cooling off, and I'm just about the point where I will stop. Don't want to overwork or like I said I can crack. Now what you notice is I have some stuff that falls off the steel. This is called fire scale. Normal part of the process. Uh, some people call it anvil dust. It's a layer of burned steel or iron oxide that forms on the surface as the steel is heating. Um, anyway. So here we go. So I'll take this, you know, maybe I'll use a little lighter hammer now. And I'm going to start that bending down process. I'm kind of rolling it over, you could say. Straighten it out. And then, you know, it may look like I'm randomly hammering, but believe it or not, I'm thinking about every hammer blow and what that will do to the shape I'm creating, what it will do to the steel. Okay, so I've made a decorative, uh, kind of a curly cue for lack of a better term for the end of the handle. It's a little nicer than just a plain blunt end. It, it's a little nicer uh, transition, you would call it. I would call it. Uh, I like to start something thin or a point uh, or something larger. Um, basically, when we're working in a lot of 
decorative ironwork, we're basically working with linear forms, like lines, like a drawing. So if you've done any drawing, you may have noticed a line that varies from thickness is a little more interesting than all lines that are all the same thickness. So it's that kind of idea. Now, what I'm gonna do next to form the handle, uh, I'm gonna shape the steel. Um, this anvil has two horns, this horn and this horn. I'm gonna use a round horn, shape the handle over this. But before I do that, I'm gonna take the steel and quench the tip that I just created because I don't want it to lose its shape. So now I can go ahead and shape that. Okay, so now I thought I'd put a little variation in here. I'm going to heat this area and kind of center the handle a little bit better. Uh, it's just one of those things, that just a little subtle difference that can make a tool look a little more interesting, give a little more finesse. So basically I'll just heat it and center that handle along the straight uh, uh, the bar, the rest of the fire poker. So I'll just take a moment to heat up. Sometimes people ask me how long uh, blacksmithing has been around. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> the, uh, so it's generally, if you look at most history books, uh, the Iron Age goes back to 1200 to 600 BC, depending on which part of the country you're looking at. So that's the generally established uh, fact. Now again, I'm cooling the area I shaped previously before, uh, let's see, maybe I'll go here. Okay. And then a little here. I do spend quite a bit of time. What I'm doing when I go like this is I'm checking for straightness and looking at the overall shape of the form I'm creating. Uh, things are easier to correct, say if they're not straight, if I do it as I go, than if I did it later. So, got my handle created. Uh, pretty happy with that. Um, now, uh, oh, I was talking a little bit about the history of iron working. Um, blacksmithing go hand in hand. One thing that's interesting to note, which I didn't realize till fairly recently, is there actually are exact decorative twists on the handle to give me a transition between the handle and the poker end of the tool. To do that, I'm gonna come over to this table and use a vise. Now, often I would do that using the heat of the forge, but today, I'm going to do a little variation of that. I'm going to use actually a torch, an oxyacetylene torch. So I'm going to clamp my steel where I want the twist to start uh, in a, I don't need a little straighter than that, in a leg vise. It's nicknamed a leg vise because of the leg that goes from the vise to the floor. These vises are made for blacksmiths, or you can hammer steel in them and so on. They're made pretty tough. Okay, so now I'm checking to make sure my wrench fits. This is a twisting wrench. 
I'll grab my torch. A twisting wrench is, uh, mine is nothing more than a, a box wrench, an old fashioned box wrench I bought for $10 and uh, welded a handle onto it. Uh, I'm gonna need some different glasses for this. I think I just left them over here, pardon me. Uh, so, the light is quite intense. That's why I need the dark glasses. So what I'm gonna do is actually use the torch as my heat source instead of the forge because I have a little bit more control with the torch. Actually, a lot more control. So, I'm gonna fire that up. And then go ahead and heat my steel. Still working in the same temperature range as just a different heat source. I'm looking for that nice orange to, oops, my glasses slid. Could be a little yellow. I'm gonna clamp the wrench on there and twist the steel. It really shows how plastic the material becomes once it's heated up. Okay, that's good. Now, the steel is 3 8 inch thick, which, relatively speaking, is not that thick, so I gotta work kind of quickly. I wanna do this while the steel is hot, literally while the iron is hot, or the steel in this case. So I've made a simple twist. And now I'm going to clamp it on the corners of the bar. It's a square bar, so on the corners I clamp. And then I use the vise and I clamp, and that will straighten the twist without distorting the shape of the, the nice twist that I created. And it looks pretty straight. So that alone is kind of nice, just a simple twist. But I'm going to do a variation of that. So I'm going to go back into the vise. And that's where the torch is really uh, very handy in this case. Uh, again, often I do that uh, in a, just right out of the forge, um, but torch makes it just a little easier for me. So once again, I'll light up this torch. Then I'll talk about the uh, process a little bit more in a moment. So I want to heat the area above the twist that I previously created. And maybe one revolution at most, or half a revolution, of the previous twist. And now, I have to remember, I want to twist the opposite direction. Okay, now I'm going to take this to the anvil. And uh, well, let's take a look at it. I'll see if it needs any additional straightening. If it does, I like to use a wood mallet because that uh, won't mar the twist. The steel hammer would. Actually, it looks pretty darn good, so I'll leave it alone. Let me brush that off a little so you can see it better. And This uh, handle opened up just a little, so give it a tap or two to correct that before that gets worse. So now I have what blacksmiths would call a reversal twist. It's that nice flowing from one direction to the other. You could repeat and keep going back and forth and back and forth, which I've done on a number of projects is fun. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of variations of twists. Um, now, 
I'm going to turn this around and work on the other end, the poker end of this tool. But I don't. I could hold this end with tongs. Uh, often we hold hot steel with tongs when we can't use uh, hold it with our gloves. Uh, but that would be a little awkward with the piece this size. So I'm going to quench this whole end. As long as it's not red hot, uh, in this case, particular case, I'm not worried about quenching that whole area. And look at that, that fast, it's cold. I can hold it in my bare hand, and I can turn it around and work on the other end. So I remember, uh, oh, remember you can leave your comments if you like. Uh, you can go ahead and leave comments on the uh, video or questions. Um, oh, what I was thinking of, uh, I remember during a demonstration, someone informed me that blacksmithing was a dying art and that is just, wow, you're lucky to see it because nobody else does it. And I'm like, I felt bad to correct them and I wasn't trying to be a smarty pants, but you know, I was doing the demonstration and actually, there are more blacksmiths than ever. And people from all walks of life, male, female, all over the place, all over the country. In fact, internationally, there's been an explosion of blacksmiths, especially in this country. I belong to a club that uh, has thousands and thousands of members. Uh, and it has, since I got into this in the late 80s, it has just grown tremendously. Their conferences are huge. Um, and so I think that's amazing. It's wonderful. The information that people are sharing, the ideas, the concepts, the tools have the people are inventing new and better tools. So really, there's been a real resurgence of interest in blacksmithing, especially in uh, terms of decorative ironwork, things like gates, railings, furniture, as well as in the knife making world, the shows like uh, we've seen on TV where they make knives and, uh, or do blacksmithing. So, just thought I would mention that. Uh, now, I'm gonna start making the tip on the other side, so I'm gonna pull that out of the forge. Now, while I was talking, still got a little bit hot. It did not burn, but they got a bunch of fire scales. So I'm gonna brush some of that off, switch back to my uh, bigger hammer. I'm gonna make a blunt taper. A point, basically, is a taper. In this case, it's going to be a real point. I don't want it too skinny because I don't want it to burn off in the next process. So when I started smithing, the, uh, where did I start? I started at the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse. Is in my hometown, La Crosse, Wisconsin. That's also where I grew up. Also, uh, for those of you who are into computer circuit boards or other, it's often used as a knife handle material, Norplex, Norplex Oak which became part of Allied Signal, I believe. Well, I know it did. I don't know if it's still there, but a huge manufacturer of micarta and other phenolic products. Uh, it's used to make the, the boards and circuit boards is its main use, made in my hometown. Okay, so, little side note for you, but now this has come up to temperature. I'm trying to keep it a little cleaner, so I'm gonna brush the steel and I'm gonna bend the tip over. I'm just gonna bend it over itself. And I'll do that on the anvil, edge of the anvil. What I did today is I put a little mark on the side of my anvil. That's what I was checking when I was leaning over the anvil. So I would know how long and a piece to fold over or bend over. Uh, 
you know, if you do a lot of these, sometimes, quite often, I'll do these in batches, like anything, like cooking, a lot of good cooks, they don't bother measuring. They can just grab a handful and say, that's exactly a cup, and they're dead on because they do it all the time. So in blacksmithing, sure, same thing. If I do a lot of these, I'll do a batch of 10 or 20 of these. I don't have to measure the size of the anvil like that, but sometimes if you're only doing one or two, it's quite helpful. So the next thing I'm going to do is I folded the end over, which will form this tip. And the other point will become this tip. This area, I'm going to weld together. Now, I'm going to weld by forge welding. Forge welding, like it sounds, is welding using the heat of the forge. Now, before they invented, you know, it was around a little before 1900, pretty much parallels the history of the development of practical uses of electricity. Before they invented electrical welding, gas welding, friction weld, other kinds of welding, there's even thermite welding. This was how all welding was done, using a forge. What I'm doing is applying flux. This is, you're gonna scrape the excess off. A mixture, I make my own, uh, you can buy it, but more economical and it's fun to make your own. <laughs> it's four parts borax, pure borax, and one part boric acid. I buy mine from McMaster Car. You could probably buy it at a pharmacy or some other place. Uh, that's where I like to get And I mix my own. I find it's actually much cheaper to mix my own and then I know exactly what's in it. What I don't want is impurities in it. There are many brands of pre-made flux, which have things in it I don't like, like iron filings. Uh, I myself do not like that. Some applications might be good. Some have iron oxide. They're red. Uh, I actually don't care for that. So this is the old recipe my old uh, instructor gave me. Now, what am I doing? I'm looking, this is my eye and my feel. I'm looking at the metal and I'm watching the flux. The flux looks like it's boiling now. Good, that's a good indicator. Next thing I want to see, I put the metal in edges up so the flux could go in between the layers, sucked in by capillary action. When I rotate that and it looks like the flux is sheeting down the sides like wax, uh, I mean raindrops on a freshly waxed car, uh, that's my indicator that it's ready to weld. And it's just starting to get, yep, I'm seeing some sheeting action now. And that's kind of a narrow window. If you wait too long, you overheat the metal. So we're good to go. Okay, now I'll brush off the excess flux. After a few moments, the metal cools off enough to where, if I were to continue hammering, it's not gonna hurt it, just thinning out the material, but it's not gonna make a better weld. So what I, my method is uh, do one weld, a little bit more brushing, brush it, and then I repeat the process to make sure I got a really good solid weld. So a little bit more of that flux. So why the flux? Anytime you weld, solder, braze, you need flux to protect the metal that you're working with uh, so oxygen can't get to it. If oxygen gets to the surface of the steel, in this case, it would burn. The weld would not occur. If you're brazing, uh, using brass or bronze rod, you need flux. Otherwise, that brass is not going to melt. Uh, it's not going to flow where you want it to. It's not going to fill the joint, create a good uh, raised joint. So the flux, flux is absolutely uh, important and necessary. It's an interesting note. Uh, I was doing a little casting in jewelry recently, casting sterling silver. The same ingredient in this flux is what I use to cast 
uh, when I melt jewelry metal, boric acid, but I use pure boric acid in that case. Boric acid, besides protecting the metal, has a cleaning action that helps to clean the metal a little bit, helps to remove some of the impurities on that, be, that may be on the surface of the metal. Okay, so I got a good sheeting action ready for another weld. And here we go. The weld is to not hit it really hard. If you hit it really hard, your layers will actually slide. Is to hit it lightly and quickly is a better bet than to hit it harder. So I purposely switched to a light hammer. Uh, this one happens to be just a 600 gram hammer. Uh, is much more effective than using a big hammer I have found. So now I'm going to stretch the area I welded out into a point. So we'll go back to this anvil. And the reason I'm doing most of the forging here is I just prefer this anvil. I just like it. Uh, my favorite one. So I'm hammering on the round horn, reducing the thickness to about half, quarter turn, then repeat. That will naturally stretch the steel into a point or a taper. Now I'm just kind of cleaning things up, straightening it out, removing marks I don't like. Plasticity of the steel when it's hot is just a wonderful thing. Something I really love about blacksmithing. And the idea that, as you can see, I can heat the material over and over, and as long as I don't overwork it, I mean, you know, getting it too hot or too cold, uh, it's not going to hurt the steel. You can just keep going. If I drop it on the floor, it's not going to break. You can just pick it up and keep going. I have to be careful and remember to wear gloves or tongs and not just pick it up. <laughs> Something every blacksmith has done at some point. Usually when you're tired, you forget and you grab something. You're like, oh, that was not a good idea. That was hot. OK, so now I need to do a little shaping more to re refine the shape I have here, the uh, point or taper. Has a few rough marks. If we looked closely, you would see them. Okay, now I want to. Okay, that didn't take long. It wasn't bad. Double check, make sure it's fairly square. Okay, now um, I want to take this tip, this barb, I'll call it, and open it up. Now it's hard to do with a hammer, so I'm going to heat it up and put it in that vise over there again, the leg vise, and I'll use a tool that looks like kind of like a little axe or hatchet. It's called a hot cut. I'm not actually going to cut the steel. I'm going to just use it to pry it open, and then I'll shape the tips of the tool. I turned the forge. You might have noticed it's a little quieter now. I turned the forge down to a lower temperature. I don't need it really, really hot if I'm not welding. So welding is done. Turn it down a bit. So now I'll go over here. So open that up. Whenever I use this tool, I'm just I can't believe that it's still going. I made this over 10 years ago, just a simple, simple tool. Believe it or not, out of a chunk of spring from a railroad uh, car, from a uh, locomotive spring. Blacksmiths 
often uh, and traditionally often have used recycled materials in the I'll call it the old days. In the old days, because steel and iron were expensive, so they were always reusing things. Uh, famously, uh, things like uh, nails were welded together is sometimes to create gun barrels because originally in the colonial times, when the states were, you know, before it was the United States, all the iron was imported in steel. It wasn't manufactured in the states. It took a while to develop that for those the processes and then to have coal mines. So it was precious. So there are cases of historic examples I've seen where if you look at it really closely, you can see the lines. And it was explained to me that blacksmiths spent many hours welding nails together to get enough material to make a gun barrel. I mean, that's just one example. Um, so I have often used things like uh, railroad spring because it was easy to find. I'm gonna shape the tip. And it's a very, very hard, tough steel, uh, which makes excellent tools. Makes all, makes great, great tools. I've made hammers, hot cuts, all kinds of things out of it. So I've shaped the uh, end. I like to give it a one, two, three kind of thing at the end. You can see this area is holding together nicely, the area I welded. So now I'll shape that barb or the other point. And what's the other point for? The other point is to pull wood in fire. Sometimes it's nice to be able to pull a piece of wood, move it around your fire. Sounds good for pushing it. Uh, this is the method uh, I think is probably the most traditional, the method I was taught, so I like to show you. There's other ways to do it. You can also bend it around, weld it to itself, leaving a loop. Then you cut through the loop, and then you have two different points. I think this way is easier. Okay, so now I want to bring this end back. And then basically just fine tune the shape a bit. And then I'm going to check for the straightness again to remove excess fire scale, clean it up, makes it look better, a little shinier, nicer look. Now I've made and used a lot of them just like this, and uh, it's fine, but you know, often to make it a little bit nicer, uh, I might paint it, sandblast it and paint it, or wire brush and paint it. Sometimes I'll uh, brush it and put a traditional wax finish on it. The, uh, I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna cool off the tool now so you can get a closer look at it. Let's dry that off a little bit with my glove and show you a little closer look. So the welded tip, if I had not welded this, this would have just split and then broken off. Ooh, the center is a little warm, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I've got my tips, uh, what we call tapers. And then I've got a little variation in the twist here, a reversal twist, and my handle. And then just for fun, I, I put the handle a little bit more centered with the bar of the uh, tool, just for fun, a little variation. Um, I always think that's a wonderful thing about being a maker, being able to make things. Making things by hand is what I'm trying to say. Is each item is a little bit, can be a little different. Uh, it has that handmade look, uh, which I appreciate and I love. I love the texture and the feel, the little variations. 
So there we have it, a traditional fire poker. Now, if you're interested in blacksmithing, we do teach, uh, I teach classes in blacksmithing in this studio. Uh, and there's a number of videos uh, online from the museum. Uh, and if you have any comments, uh, feel free to leave them. And thank you. Thanks for watching my demo. That was a lot of fun. <laughs>